Um, so this is uh, another installment of our OCSBLT webinar series. So welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on this live stream. And uh, we will be recording this so you can pass it on to your colleagues if you do miss anything or you want to um, take a look at it again because we did go um, at a certain pace. Hapara Workspace is a uh, big and vast entity that we're going to try to cover in 50 minutes and a lot of time for questions. Uh, we know we are going to uh, do our best to give our experience about how to use this tool, but we know that with Workspace, the world's your oyster. Um, it is a, a place that you can make it your own. And these are just going to be some examples that we are going to look at from the system. And we have invited some awesome uh, educators with some practical examples to look at that. But before we get started, um, we do want to uh, respectfully acknowledge that our board uh, is located on the ancestral traditional and unceded Indigenous territory of the Algonquin peoples, on whose territory we pray, learn, play, and work. And for those who joined in last week at the teacher dashboard session, it's still applicable for us right now for this to ground ourselves in prayer and being in the moment and recognizing people are in many places in mind and spirit. So please join us in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God of hope, Comfort and restore all those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the first slide that I'm showing you right now is a certification page. And I just wanted to start with that. Um, it may seem out of place, but because of um, the capacity that's being built across the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Um, there is, through Hapara, uh, a champion educator and scholar certification process, and the link is below on here for you to get more information about that. Um, through our leading and learning journeys, we've also been able to adapt that within the Ottawa Catholic School Board and also kind of OCSBFI it with uh, deep learning and different tools that we use on our student, uh, our staff portal, I should say. And so the reason why I bring that up is currently we have about uh, 300 members of our system that have taken advantage of that. And uh, I've invited a couple of our early adopters in uh, the Hapara world, um, Dashboard and Workspace, to join us for today. So they will introduce themselves uh, just coming up. So Julian, I'm going to pass that on to you. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm so excited to be here for round two today with everything Hapara. Um, currently, I work at St. Michael Ottawa Catholic School and I teach grade four, five, and six immersion. Hapara is going to blow your mind, so get ready for a rocking session today. Good morning. My name is Heather Builder. I am a grade nine, uh, 10 religion and French immersion teacher at St. Francis Xavier. I am a lover of all things Sapara, and I'm so excited to share that with you today. And I'm Tracy Nazarella, and I'm a grade six language and math teacher at St. Jerome. And I love Papara, and I'm looking forward to sharing my experience with you. Perfect. Thanks, team. And I'm Bill Corcoran. I'm a coordinator with Learning Technologies, and I work with a great consultant team and department and uh, with the central staff at the CC to help support teachers and students in using tools that we uh, support across the system. And of course, Sapara is a big one and one of my favorites, too. So we look forward to, uh, to digging into Workspace um, with this with you. Um, as I've already mentioned, that workspace uh, has that low floor and high ceiling piece. We do recognize that people joining the session today may be just uh, digging a little bit, and some people may have uh, uh, been using it a lot and looking for different uh, tips and tricks to look at it. So we'll try to accommodate as best we can. Uh, but we do know that um, we just want to kind of show you uh, some ways in which we're using it, as I mentioned, and how you might adapt that to uh, go along with your workflow. So we're going to kind of move out of the slide deck in just a moment, but I do want to give you a sense that this is kind of our agenda. Number one's at the biggie. Um, that's why it's uh, within 50 minutes, we're going to look at workspace and then kind of adapt that to how we can support you and how do you uh, share this with what the student view looks like for those questions you might get from the parents. And then of course, questions at the end. So this is kind of our overview as we're looking at. So the why, the workspace um, and that type of thing. And then the biggest piece, the biggest uh, bulk of our session is going to be using the talents of Tracy, Julian and Heather to to share their experiences with with you and the system through this webinar. And then, of course, at the end, I'll kind of uh, consolidate that into what that sees, what the student sees um, from their workflow as getting in through the student portal and such. And of course, time for questions uh, near the end. 
so at this point, I'm going to uh, move myself out of this view and, and move towards the staff portal. Um, I'm going to enter through workspace by not clicking on the icon because that will bring me to teacher dashboard, uh, not clicking on the dashboard word and click on workspace. Bringing me to the workspace here is workspace.teacherdashboard.com. And as it loads in, um, you will notice that if it's uh, been, been a bit for you um, going into workspace that there is a, a different view. There is a previous layout um, button at the top. Um, you can flip back, but um, for anybody just really going into it, this is the way that Hapara is going. Um, so if you're just starting anew, you would probably be best served in this area because this is the way, uh, like I said, uh, things are adapting and moving as a day. So you can see that when I come in here, I can see all the um, workspaces that are currently owned by me. I can search all my workspaces in here, which is which is great, which is helpful, because sometimes they don't always move to the top, even though I have the sort by last modified, which is does a pretty good job, but sometimes I do have to uh, search myself. I can search all of them, or I can toggle between anything that's in draft or published. So the biggest thing that when we come into our session today, um, when you do create a workspace, um, in that entity of that, that building part right now, just know that nothing is available to your students until you click published. So under here, I'm gonna to go to my test one. You can see that it's either in draft, which is when you create a workspace by clicking create at the top, and it comes in as a draft at that top at that time. So nothing is available to your students until you click published in your uh, workspace, um, just so that even you're building all this, it would not be accessible uh, to your students. I'm gonna go into my, uh, quickly, I'm gonna go into my, workspace from last week. And you will see that there are some things that you're seeing, such as an image on the card. Um, this this sort of band right here that you see, this workspace, will show up after you create one. So when you create one and then you come back to your kind of dashboard here for your workspace where your all your menus are, you will be able to click on change this image. It's beneficial to you um, because the student might be able to pick it out on their um, uh, a student dashboard in their workspace entry point and some different things you see here. So I'm going to click on this and this we qu uh, quickly built last week at the webinar with on teacher dashboard. And I just want to show you this uh, quickly because um, this is our low floor please and it's not a low floor because it's not effective. Uh, when you want to use workspace and you're just going in or you just have one simple thing you want to put it is okay um, to just have something in the evidence column or just something in the evidence column and maybe a resource here. That is okay to have a workspace um, that isn't built on over time. Again, the purpose of the advertising for this session is that we wanted to dig deeper into it and see what its possibilities. So what we're going to show you is things that have been built up over time and for the purpose of today's uh, webinar is to show you all the possibilities. So to show all those possibilities, you're gonna see lots of cards, you're gonna see lots of items on there. So just know um, that if you are just coming in and joining this session uh, with Workspace, it's okay just to have one item here that the students can go through the evidence column. So I'm just gonna reset myself and then uh, go into our Workspace that you will see kind of being used at hand today, which will be our Digging Deeper into Hapara Workspace. And when I load in, uh, there's not going to be too much time I'm going to spend right now on this. I'm going to hand it off to Tracy in just a few moments. But um, as I load in, you can just see that that's a test one card. As we scroll down, that's where we're going to have people showing and sharing some of their experiences. But I will direct you to the groups on the side. You're going to see different groups such as language arts, blue jays. You're going to see group three, four, five, six, seven, eight teacher resource, whole class, that type of thing. And you're gonna see those um, touched on through the next three uh, experience sessions with Tracy, Julian, and Heather. And at the end, I'm gonna come back and say, well, how did we kind of set those up? They're gonna show you how they're set up and linked to the cards and they may allude to the students and groups, but I'll come back to that at the end, just in case we you think we're, we're going past that. But in terms of my part, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen uh, now and I'm gonna transition it over to Tracy. So Tracy, when you're ready, can you flip on your mic and can you share your screen please? And I will uh, pass on, so thanks Tracy. Great, hi guys. Um, I'm just gonna share with you um, what I've been doing with um, the distance learning. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, this is my workspace that I've been using with my grade six students. And I've made a couple decisions about my workspace and I'll just kind of share with you my thought process. 
So this is a really big workspace because it's at the end of the month. So what I've been doing since March is I've been making a new workspace with each month. And I've been finding that's been working with my students. Um, they also have a French workspace as well. So it's really just cutting down the amount of workspaces that they have to go into every day. So this one is I've put all our religion, math and language all together. So you can kind of see it here. Um, what I've just, um, how I've decided to organize it is the top of my cards, all the cards I've placed at the top, I've just um, put that there's no real content there other than sort of um, little keeping, like housekeeping items. So our goals of the week I keep here. I do a workspace tour and I just do that on uh, Screencastify. Um, and I, so you can kind of see that. So. Um, I just use screencast and I outline every week for the students what the work looks like. And I also send a copy to the parents so the parents know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the work. The next thing I'm, I'm finding really super beneficial is the Google form feedback. I place a Google form in my slide deck or in my workspace every week. And it's just um, for me just to see if the, the work's too hard, too easy, what are their favorites? So then I try to gear it to them. And the reason why I um, leave this here is because I like to push all the newest work to the top of the workspace. I'm just going to show you a different workspace so you can see what that means. So when you place cards at the top of your workspace, you can't, they're fixed, you can't move them. So this is a, a math one that I've used uh, from a couple months ago before remote learning. And all I generally place up here is just the goals of the entire unit that we're going to look on. And then I add sections as we go through the um, the unit. So you can kind of see that they're all out of order right now because I've been pushing the most uh, recent to the top. So when you do things in a section, you can do that. So going back to my original one, here's a math section and they're really easy to build. You just type whatever you want to type and then the week and then you just press enter and then it'll create your section for you and then you can add cards that way. Um, I've used groups as well, um, like Bill was saying. So I have whole group cards. I have some small group cards for some of my modified learners. I also have a teacher group um, and Heather will explain how she uses it and I use it in the same way, so I won't steal um, that. And I also organize things based on subject. So I've, I've um, added my students into a math group and when they click this, it actually filters out all the cards that are not math related. And I've done the same with language arts. And I find that this really helps the kids scaffold. If, if they're feeling really overwhelmed by all the work, they can just simply look at the math if they're just looking at math that day. It would also be a great way to organize your workspace if you were um, doing a split class, for example, if you had grade fours and grade fives using some of the same resources, but then um, you wanted to be able to separate um, their cards for them. So it's a, a great way to use it. So I'm just gonna go back to the full thing. Um, I've also used groups in a couple other ways. So with working at home, we haven't been able to work as collaboratively as we normally would in the um, classroom. And my students really miss that. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been putting in like a math warm up um, and I put it as group evidence. So everybody in the um, class gets the same access to the same um, slide deck. So they all have, it's not a copy, it's the whole group is working in the same copy. And then what they do, there's a prompt and then they put a name on it and so they can get hints from each other just like what we do when we're working at the whiteboards in our classroom they could take hints from each other um, they just have to type their name and then write their ideas on the slide um, the only caveat with this is that the students cannot submit the card when they are finished because then it cuts off access to the rest of the kids in the class so i put these little reminders everywhere for them to um not submit the card. And then the last thing I want to kind of point out is I use headers. And at the end of the lesson or at the end of the webinar today, Heather and I are going to show you how to make these. But I find them really helpful, especially in elementary, to help guide the kids 
where we're going. Um, I want them to start here, for example, with the warm up, and then I want them to move to the lesson. So the headers um, are really helping them guide um, them where to go. Um, in elementary especially, I find um, the kids don't always read what's on the card. So I use these headers to kind of help keep them uh, focused at the task at hand. So here's a couple examples. I have some primary headers just with some simple text and some pictures, some kinder headers just with um, colors and numbers, and then the ever popular Bitmoji he headers, which um, my kids really, really like. So that's how I'm setting up things for myself for um, at home uh, learning and uh, hopefully you got some ideas and now I'm going to um, stop presenting and I'm going to pass it off to Julian. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, so I'm going to show you what's worked for me in distance learning right now. Um, so again, um, for me, HAPRA has been and always will be that amazing workflow uh, design platform. So um, at the very beginning, what we realized is that <clears throat> HAPRA Workspace really does lend itself perfectly to that personalized learning platform and it's end-to-end -end unit design. So what Tracy was telling you about the different sections, many of us on this call have actually um, embraced that and used them as you could see in our distance learning workspaces. You'll see that I've actually made a bit of a different decision. Um, at the beginning of the year, I've always told my students to just scroll down. However, I do see amazing value in this button to click up to have the most relevant cards at the top. But the way that I structured it is when I would meet with my kids, I would tell them that all of your resources and um, little tips and tricks for extra practice can be at the top here links to websites, um, different resource cards, etc. Um, as well, I've appended a little Google Read and Write um, overview just to have a quick refresher on if they need to use that tool, how to access that tool, how to click it from your extensions if it's not showing up. So I've decided to keep that at the top as like a one-stop shop. Um, I've also decided with distance learning um, that as a French teacher, I've um, made that decision to always stick with French throughout every single week, but to interchange science. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview. The way that I always structure my workspace, I have a little introductory video that explains everything on the workspace, similar to what Tracy was saying. Um, excuse my thumbnail picture, it always captures the worst angle. Um, so I explain all the cards, what the goals are for this week, and it just lends itself to that differentiation. Instead of writing it out, for example, for students who might have accommodations, they're able to see that, hear that, and listen to it, in addition to reading all of these resources. So um, the best thing that I love about HAPRA, what I mentioned before, is that differentiation piece. So before I go in and explain some of my cards, I just wanted you to pay attention to some of the groupings on the left here. I have mystery grade fours, grade fives, grade sixes. And these are groups that I would typically have students in that are at the average level or where they should be. But let's say that you need to differentiate or you need to plan and program for an accommodated learner. These are where these groupings come super, super in handy. So you want to click on your students in groups. And as you can see here, this is a blank workspace just to protect uh, student identity. We have my grade four group, grade five group, grade six group. You'll see that I have Bill assigned here in my grade fives. And here is where I would have grade four sharks, grade five sharks, grade six sharks. You do want to keep in mind that you don't want to name these differentiated groups uh, based on IEP or ELL because those kids can see that. So I like to make a little nickname they have no idea most of the time they don't even really understand so um, what these groupings are for they just click on their work and, and they know what to do so this is where I would put those groupings of students if they were being differentiated for um, and again right here in your classes this is where Bill will explain to you later where you can click and drag those students in to differentiate your program so I am going to work out of um, the Mr. D's grade five workspace for a second. And I'm just gonna show you um, some of the card functionalities, in specific, the submission card function. Um, so the submission card on Hapra is probably the most popular card in terms of, oops, I'm in my all groups. You don't wanna do that. You wanna see the holistic view of just your grade fives, um, which is kind of good as well, just to see how you've streamlined and assigned each card. So all of the cards that I've assigned my students in grade five, they're gonna see on this workspace. So what Bill is gonna see is all of this stuff on here. 
So as an example, like I said, I have an introductory video. I then have resources. And like I said, when you're differentiating, Hapra allows the beauty of including multiple links that you can add. Here is an energy and electricity slide deck that I have students if they want to read it. I have a screencast of myself reading over it. And then I have an instruction for how to complete the activity. So I'm a color person. I'm also a little bit particular with curriculum colors. So I know that the science curriculum is blue and the social studies curriculum is green. Science, I've chosen here on Hapra, you can choose tags. A rocket ship for me seems like science. So each tag and each color go together. You're gonna wanna note that um, in terms of consistency because as your sections get longer and bigger, you can see here that um, they don't always flow at the same um, at the same level. So I've chosen to tag it so that students know exactly which resource goes with which card. Um, you'll see here just now that I'm going to be explaining the submission card. All of these are different resources. So the kids typically would look into this one-stop shop for myself, no other place to look. You can add up to five links, I think. I might be wrong on that. It might have gotten better. But here is the crux of the program. So here you can see that Bill has started this task. Okay, now I'm going to actually recreate this task so you can see exactly how this submission folder works. So you're going to want to click the plus button. You're going to want to name it task one or activity one, energy and electricity. And after that, you're going to want to put a little description. This is the work. And I'll show you what that looks like in a bit more of a, a better view. But here is the crux of it. Now you want to upload your resources. You have three options. You can upload from your computer, you can upload from your Google Drive, or you can add a link, Screencastify, whatever it may be. You also have the option to create a new document. I wouldn't recommend that because I like to organize myself from my Google Drive and pick things from there. So for the sake of this activity, I'm going to click on that Drive icon, and I'm going to type in Energy and see what pops up. Usually the most recent activity will pop up. I'm going to click here. I know that I made this one yesterday. I'm going to select it. And what it's actually doing is it's digitally photocopying that work for you for all of your students. And like Tracy said, you either have the option to have that digital photocopy per student or per group. For the sake of this task, I'm going to make it per student because this is individual evidence that I want to collect. The next part that you want to do is you want to schedule their start date. Um, I know a lot of high school teachers have benefited from this. For myself and distance learning, it has really worked for me. So I'm going to click on today, okay? Wednesday, May 27th, and the due date I'm going to put on to, let's say, June 18th, okay? Um, I'm going to assign it to my group. So you remember that groupings tab that we had up at the very top? Um, I organized all of my groups succinctly and made sure that they're all streamlined for differentiation. In this case, I just want Bill in my grade five class to see it. So Mr. D's grade five, I've assigned that group. If you do have something that you've differentiated, you can click on your grade five charts as well from this box. And then finally, what you want to do is click on this tag button. Like I said, I'm a color person. Science curriculum is blue. Rocket ships remind me of science. So I'm going to tag it as blue. The final thing you're going to do is click done. And then the best part of it is that Hapra has all of these colors that you can choose. I'm going to choose blue again because the curriculum is blue. And now the students know exactly which card goes with which task. Okay, so as you can see here, this is a French activity that I've done. Very similarly, I've made the success criteria for what a journal entry looks like, nothing fancy, and then just a screencast of my explanation of how to do that task so the kids can pop in and do that. The final thing that I wanted to show you is the student view. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at Bill and see that everything that I've assigned for Bill is exactly how I want it. So you want to click on preview as student. Okay, so I'll do that again. You see all of your all of your um, groups here at the top. You've assigned all of your cards to the students that you need to. Now you just want to perfect it and make sure it's done properly. Click on the chevron. Click on the little eyeball. It's going to pop you into what the exact vision of Bill would be looking at. It says here you are previewing as Bill Corcoran. So I'm going to scroll down to week four, which is what I've done. I could see here that Bill has not started. There is a due date for Thursday, June 18th. But I'm also going to scroll down and see that Bill has also started some of the activities. And it's saying here that he could submit them. So I know that there's a checkbox saying he started. If your student, for example, didn't submit the work, after you publish it, you're saying, oh no, I need to get them to submit it. How am I going to do it? You can actually submit it for them on their behalf. Send work to teacher, yes. 
I'm gonna do it again. Oops, it's because Bill is not assigned right now as a member, but once they started the activity, typically in a classroom, it would submit. And you do have that option to send it. And then in your actual um, workspace dashboard, oh, my timer went off, which means I'm out of time. But in your workspace dashboard, a submitted column will be right here saying that he submitted it. And I know I'm on seconds to go, but I just wanted to show you when you are programming for differentiated learners, you can go in and pop into that workspace and make sure you see exactly what those differentiated students see. And whatever you don't put in these two columns at the end, in the student view, it'll bump it out and just take over the full screen as it did for Bill. That's it for me. I hope this has been helpful for you. On to you, Heather. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to present my screen now and I'm going to kind of talk you through how I've been approaching distance learning. So every week I send my students an email and I link it to this hyperdoc and I give them a breakdown of the work for the week. So I've included a calendar for their schedule. I've included this month's daily doodle activity. And then I've given them a breakdown for the week. So the period two class is working from this date to this date. We have our virtual class, our Google Meet scheduled for this date. And I've included um, just a quick Pear Deck check-in to see how they're doing, see if they have any questions. I usually include um, the, the daily doodle in there as well. And then I break down my workspaces. So they have to do these listening activities in the Aquits workspace. They have a Flipgrid challenge that's hyperlinked via this document. And then they have some other activities to complete in their Genius Hour workspace. So in high school, I found that working through multiple workspaces has been beneficial to my students. We have certain topics like grammar that we work on throughout the entire course of the semester. And then we have other ones that are more like units of studies, like uh, a novel study or a Genius Hour or listening activities. So this way they know exactly which workspaces to focus on and it's really clear for them. And when I navigate to what that looks like for me, when I start with my workspace, what I like to do first as a second language teacher is I like to rename these. So you can just click on this little pencil icon and you can rename these uh, column headers to whatever topics you'd like. For me, I usually go with things like uh, these objectives that count stage or les ressources, but you can rename these whatever works for you. And if we scroll down here, I can show you a little bit about how I've been structuring my workspaces. So in my workspaces or in your own, you may find that when you put all of these cards together, it starts to look a little overwhelming and it looks like a lot. So I've been using sections to break things up, whether it's by week or by step or by topic in a unit. And then I can drag my cards to these other sections. Um, so sometimes this happens where you'll see that it's not possible to drag. Uh, if this happens to you, you just need to refresh your browser and usually that'll fix this little glitch. I'll give it a second and I'll scroll down. So then if I want to move this reflection card to a lower section, I can just drag it and then there's this little black dot that will show me where that card will go once I've moved it. And I can do the same here. And this just makes my workspace a little bit more manageable, a little less overwhelming, and a little easier for my students to follow. Um, and then they can navigate those different sections readily and easily. Like Tracy, I like to structure my workspaces in reverse chronological order, meaning I have the most recent step at the top and the later or the oldest step uh, lower down. When I spoke to my students during our classes, uh, they highlighted this as something that they preferred in terms of a way we set things up. So in this first column here, I've set up my goals. I keep it really simple. What do I want you to be able to achieve by the, or what will you be able to do by the end of this set or this like section or this workspace? And then in the second column, I include any resources that I want them to have. So this one here, I've included uh, a Pear Deck link to some slides I want them to go over. I've included a link to a website with a little challenge. And I've included a screencastify explaining how to use MLA citation in Google Docs. In this third site or column here, I have all of the activities that I want them to complete. So for this particular topic, I want them to complete this research assignment, and then I want them to complete this reflection. Now what I like to do is also keep things really visible for them, so I include a rubric that corresponds to the 
work that's being done in this third column so that it's really easy for them to see what my expectations are and how I'm going to be evaluating that. Then if we look at this third column, like Julian said, this is the crux of workspace. This is where you are exchanging resource or information with your students. They're demonstrating their knowledge. So if you look on this card, I can see that I have one student who has submitted their work. So if I open it up, I can see their name and I can access their work. Now for this particular assignment, it focuses a lot on feedback. So this student, I've asked them to come up with an inquiry question and share their question here. My student has shared their question and then they have to wait to find out whether or not it's been approved by me, what my feedback is for their next steps or how they can improve it. So I would give the students some feedback here. I would type out my comments. Uh, I suggest that they see the video, that they look at you know, increasing their, or improving their question by turning it into a level three inquiry question. And then I would put either a check mark for approved or I would leave this blank. Now, when I've done this, there's a couple ways that I like to indicate that I've left feedback for a student. So what I'll typically do is I'll highlight this and then I'll come and press this little add comment button. And then what I can do is I can actually tag the student in the comment. So I can say Bill Corcoran, I would like to assign this to him. And I click this assign button. Now by doing this, Bill is going to receive an email from me indicating that I have left feedback for him. and I've left him something to do. So I'll click assign and Bill will receive that email. The other nice thing about this is that I can track these comments. So Google History will allow me to see this by clicking on the comment button later. I can see any other comments that I've left, whether they've been completed or not. And then when I come back here, in order to indicate to Bill that I've left him some feedback as well, I'm gonna type in the word edit. Uh, this just tells him that I've edited his work, he has something to change, and then I can select it and I can hit return for edit. Had he finished this, work already and I wanted to leave a grade for him, I could put a grade level here and then I could return final. And this will send him his mark. It will be visible on that card. For these purposes, I'm gonna click return edit. And then in Bill's view, what he would see down in this bottom right corner is the word edit. So it's a visual cue or a prompt to tell him that some feedback has been left. The other really nice thing about this is you can click on this grade sheet button and Hapara will auto-populate all of the grades for the assignments that students have completed and submitted. Now, the other thing that Tracy alluded to a little bit is this idea of a teacher group. So I like to keep Hapara as like my one-stop shop. I put absolutely everything in there. I put my teacher resources in there. I put my evaluation tools in there, absolutely everything. So for this particular section in this workspace, I have a Pear Deck, but I also need to be able to access and edit the slides that accompany this. And I don't want to share those with my students. So I've linked them down here, and then I've only shared it with this one group. And that one group is my teacher resource group. And I keep it completely empty, as in I don't add any students to that group. And that way, no student will have access to that cart. The other thing I like to do is embed my uh, evaluation process, or my like rubrics, or whatever I'm using to mark students. Uh, I use a lot of Doc Appender to evaluate student work, so I add the link to that form. And then I can simply select my student, and then work through my curriculum expectations and indicate what the student can or cannot do. I can leave an evaluation, add my comments, and then when I submit, it will auto-populate a Google Doc with all of their assessments and evaluations. Um, the only other thing that I think is worth uh, noting is, like Tracy said, you can add some information um, to these group evidence cards. But if you want to have this bold text so that students really remember not to submit something, you can use basic HTML formatting if you're really into that kind of thing. So you just use this kind of code here if you want to kind of change the look of certain text with italics or bold. Uh, I think that that's it for me. Uh, the Oh, sorry, one last thing. Uh, just like you can add absolutely anything to a workspace, that be uh, an uploaded PDF, a link to a website, a video, Quizlet, whatever, you can also leave cards that are blank for your students. So in this card here, I haven't added anything to it. This means that I've left it open for the students to upload whatever they think is pertinent. So if I had a choice board or if I had an open-ended assignment where they could create whatever product they wanted, Having a blank card will allow the students to upload whatever they want. And when they see it, it will look just like when you have the card, it will say drag media here and it will give them the same options. So that is it for me. I will pass it back to Bill. 
Perfect. Thanks so much, Heather, Julian, and Tracy. Um, just seeing the many different ways in which you're using your workspaces is, is great. So thanks for sharing all that. Um, so I'm going to kind of go in and, and finish my part. And I will say a lot, a lot of questions that we do get surrounding workspace as well, especially when they see them today on, on this webinar is uh, digging into those is digging into those headers. And we have allocated time for us as we finish off the session today to show you how we would how we do that, um, how we can do that basic piece of not just changing the color, but by putting an image on. And then we will uh, allow for some bonus time for people who really want to kind of geek out on trying to how do you create those. Um, and so we will have our team uh, sharing, behind, staying behind to share that with them as well. So I'm going to share my screen and um, basically kind of follow up on some of the points that we are working on right now. So I'm just going to let that load in. Awesome. And so some of the things that we get on, uh, we've the way you do use workspaces, um, you can tell that our team with uh, Heather, Julian, and Tracy, we were all referencing some items that we had in this workspace right now. Um, how did we do that? Um, how did we share that with our uh, colleagues um, if we wanted to do that, whether it was a grade level colleague or different subject levels and so forth? Um, on the workspace piece here, um, I was able to scroll down a bit. And as you have more groups, it scrolls down even further and further. You can see that there's due dates and no upcoming due dates. So that's why it's beneficial, as Julian was showing, putting on those dates that can be beneficial for you, but also what the student would see, namely the classes that are involved in here and the teachers. So these are your collaborators, just like on a Google Doc, you could share that with it. When you're adding a teacher in here, um, this is for the purpose of collaboration. So for, for this one, it's not like Google where it's going to pick up all your contacts. So you do have to copy and paste or manually type. So for today, I'm just going to put my own email. .ca. If it shows up red, that person is not in there, um, but all our educators are in this session, um, in this domain. So if you type them in, I click on add teacher and it will load in. Um, doing it usually one by one, because um, usually you're not sharing with too, too many people, uh, does usually suffice. You can remove people in here if needed. Um, Sometimes people, we do get questions about, okay, I've made this. This is kind of like our template. We've made this as a master workspace. Um, if there's three teachers, but then you don't want to always assign people within this. Um, we do sometimes prompt people to go up to the three dots at the top right and make a copy of the workspace. Um, so as you kind of get it to where you want, it, it works well in the sense that if you make a copy, um, you do get your own template, you can add your own students and then you're not kind of crossing uh, three different teachers with three different classes and you leave this one untouched. Um, but the only caveat to that would be is that if I continue up to update this master workspace, um, sometimes we even, when we edit the workspace, um, we might call it master workspace ahead of it. So when I'm searching for it, it might be there. So it's again, how you want to use it with the uh, colleagues. So have that conversation. Am I going to use this with my class or am I, is this just a master template that I could be able to do as I go through that? So the next piece I want to touch on is these groups. So we kind of uh, got a good sense of how we could click on it and how as, a, as an educator, I can sort and make these big workspaces and cards kind of filter them. Um, and how we might use it as a placeholder, for, as a teacher resource, or as a, just an empty card, or to differentiate, which are all awesome ideas. When you create your workspace, you may or may not have a group that shows up um, that says kind of whole class. So I just wanted to kind of show you, like um, has already been shown already, what it kind of looked like on our back end of things. And the reason why I'm showing you is because I have a sandbox account that has fake students, so students one through 20, and they're not named. So for the purpose of today, you can see that the class groups um, from my teacher dashboard, when I created groups on uh, teacher dashboard, they actually carry over here, which is great. So um, sometimes having that set up um, in dashboard allows us to continue to use those groups over and over again, no matter what what workspace you are looking at. Some people like to create the, the construct of the workspace and then copy a workspace over and over again. When you copy a workspace, you're not going to copy the students over. You're going to copy the groups and how it's set up, but the students will not remain. So you'll have to um, bring them in as you do that. And even if you search uh, the database that I'll show you at the end for it. So for today, you can see that this is language arts. We have Blue Jays and four students. Um, I'm going to show you how if you uh, logged in, and you looked at your students and groups and there was no groups here, zero, and not even one with your whole class. When you set it up, you have an option to all create my own groups or not. And 
if you don't have any here, that's not a problem. It's very simple to create it. You can see that I already did that in yesterday's session, but I will, I, sometimes I create it, I remove it by calling a whole class and I'll just do it again and choose a color. And you can always choose a color again and click next. So right now this group is empty as you're seeing. As I kind of close the chevrons, and you can do it while it's open as well, but sometimes I just reset myself. If I take this class or classes, depending on what you're setting up, sometimes it's simple, just one, click and drag it into that empty spot. This group is empty and you can see that it's loading in and my whole class is there. So that group will be one whole class. So that's, that's saying that you didn't have anything there. If you did choose that option, you would already have one group here that is your whole class. In terms of differentiating based on whatever strategy um, you want, um, and it could, again, it could be subject areas like it was shown. So if I created a group, I could call this group and again, edit, this could be science. And again, what has been shown to you is I dropped my whole class in there and you could use that just for science and filtering through science tasks. But group four or blue jays or group six might be a different reading level. It might be somebody, uh, a group for um, ELL or so forth. So group four could be named something different. And in that case, I could just grab students individually um, that I feel should be part of that group. And you can see that they're being dragged over. So it could be the ones that make sense to you in that moment. Uh, and you can see that they're being dropped in right now, student four, 14, five, three. Um, I might need to do that as a group. So that's what you are seeing on the previous pages that it's worth that, it's that short-term pain for long-term gain to kind of set it up in a way that makes sense to you um, when you look at it. So when I reset to my workspace, I'm able to see all the cards and again um this is it might be busy to the teacher that's why the student view and the filter view of these groups is helpful because it allows me to see a little bit more of what the student might see um, on that end of things because a master workspace for the teacher can get busy over time but what the student might see is might actually not be that busy in that moment so in a moment, I'm going to switch to a student view, but I wanted to reset to my own workspaces uh, sort of entry point as I get in my menu. So I mentioned before when I came in here, this is our workspace we are working on today. When I click on the uh, edit thumbnail, and this is a feature that's awesome, you get to come in and they are royalty free images from Unsplash. So you can click into technology or whatever, and you can see that this is the image I, I took and I put it in there. Um, you also have ability to search them and just kind of uh, look through these ones. At the very least, why we really like that is because it kind of separates some options. And there's a lot of things you can do with the images to tailor it to your to your work. This add label piece here, um, what would be I added OCSBLT, but it also could be a webinar. I'm going to create a webinar uh, tag, and um, for me, that's not for my students, that's for my own organization because under my labels, if I search there, I might be able to filter them as my workspaces get bigger and bigger as well. You can also see I can publish and unpublish here and I can copy um, just directly from here or archive it at the end so I would uh, it wouldn't be accessible or I could delete it. Um, the other thing, just as I'm thinking of it, as I before I go to the student view, um, one of the examples we've heard people in the system using before in terms of groups was to, uh, if they had a split class in elementary where all the students are grouped together, they may have a, a group for uh, grade fours and a five. So when you're just differentiating a certain curriculum just by grade level, um, that is something that can also be done. So that was a, that was a nice uh, tip and trick that we've uh, seen people using as well. So I'm gonna switch over in the next few moments to kind of look at the student view. And this is student um, 17. So student 17 is one that uh, has been shared with on the workspace that you are just uh, a part of in this webinar. Um, they access the uh, student portal as part of their school and maybe bookmarked it at the top. So how does a student get to the work that they need? And I think that's very important when we look at um, the difference between uh, the language that we use. Um, so if we are using teacher dashboard, if we say go to your folder um, and we message that to the students and to the parents, um, they may be familiar with different teachers, uh, what that workflow might be. With teacher dashboard, there are folders in Google Drive. So we might say your Google Hapara folder um, versus going to your Hapara workspace, which is what we're talking about today. 
Hapara has uh, brought out a student dashboard, which has been great. Before it was just Hapara workspace for students, and now it, it combines kind of a more of a, a dashboard piece. And we're going to click on there. So again, the student got to the student portal and they clicked on this icon right now, this K to six, it looks the same in the seven to 12 portal. And they click on it and they load in their student dashboard. So right now, when it used to be workspace, you can see it kind of still looks the same. Right now, what they're seeing is all my classes and they can filter it down to language arts. I'm filtering it down to language arts. You may not see a big difference here, but if there's only a couple workspaces in there, um, this is the class we were using in our uh, webinar so far. So you can see right now, they see the image on the right hand side and they see the um, the webinar series and the little description. That's why the description in the workspace is helpful as well, because it's, uh, it's good for them to kind of oversee it. If I click onto it, this is gonna go exactly into a view that uh, was just showed through that eyeball feature that you've seen in uh, there. And you can see this is what that student is attached to. This student could look at language arts and could click start. And you can go through and student 17 might already have some ones that they've gone into. They can drag media, you can see what it looks like. And here's that submit piece that I was looking at for student 17. I could submit it or um, you could submit it for your student on there. So you can kind of see this is what student 17 um, sees as they open up. And this is just opening the task. So I'm going to flip back to their workspace. And uh, you can see that it's not as busy as the teacher and master um, as well. And they can differentiate through their groups. And these are the only ones that they're attached to. So the student has to be dropped into that grouping on the teacher end to be able to filter group five or, or Blue Jays or language arts, that type of thing. So I'm gonna kind of bring it back um, to their kind of home and their student dashboard, just to kind of go over another item before we finish off with some, uh, some questions. So again, uh, my classes, this to-do piece on the side here, you can see that this is due Friday. So in terms of the student and helping them with their workflow and their executive functioning and chat organization, it's kind of helpful in here when we do have some timelines as well. Uh, it could be starting point. And again, uh, putting that starting point is also a nice uh, tip and trick for that. If it's later than today, it will only sh show up on those dates for the student, but the due date also um, will help us uh, manage in this area for them to be able to make sure that they can kind of keep themselves on track. It doesn't mean they can't submit after the due date, but it gives you some information on what that looks like. And again, their files, some notifications like they've shared, and they can filter through the top here, due dates, no due dates, and so forth. So that's just the student view that I wanted to show you. So it's uh, it's kind of very similar to that uh, eyeball feature in terms of when you get into the workspace, but this piece here, the student dashboard, is something that is uh, helpful to them. In terms of uh, teachers, you have shared with me, you have my labels, professional learning. I'm going to jump back in here to the uh, Digging Deeper workspace. And this can be one of the last pieces I'm going to share with you before we move on to our questions. Is that how do we manage this and why would I shift from using just teacher dashboard and using the files as they get bigger and bigger and bigger over um, a semester term and we've had so many units in that science folder, how do we organize that? Um, workspace in these sections are definitely helpful. In terms of the teacher managing that and all those submissions, uh, that's one of the big features we've at, got asked as well. Okay, I'm in dashboard. I've shared a slide deck, a portfolio, a reflection, and I want them to. I want to know that they have finished that card. Well, in this case, we have this uh, feature started, submitted, assessed. Has been explained. We also have these tabs at the top. The activity activity summary. You can see that as a whole. This is what they're going on. I can scroll down, it gets bigger and bigger. You can see evidence activity here. You can see that one student, there's been editing features and so forth and submitted evidence um, laying right here as well. And this is for all the students. It's a kind of a big overview dashboard. And then clicking here gives you that individual activity for that student. So it breaks it down a little bit, but we find um, when, so if I scroll down to 17, you can kind of see that that's the history of, of seven, student 17's work. We do find a lot of people like to stick in the uh, workspace area and kind of use this area, the activity status to kind of use and launch their work from as well. And the last piece that we'll just reference um, for you is that as a teacher, we know that uh, sometimes it's great to see other people's workspaces. And when you can post them here, you can make your uh, workspaces public. Um, and when, right now that means that in my workspace before I go there um, and, and flip on that setting is that that makes it accessible to other people to be able to not see students, but to be able to copy and kind of share your learning with others. In the discover area, 
you can go in here and you can search. Uh, it, it is in beta. They're trying to work on different tagging and subject areas from around the world. But you could search something in here like um, it, it could be something related to in the environment or it could be some of the examples here in a math, a certain uh, uh, term in, in math, that type of thing. And you can search it. And when you get in there, you have that same option to copy them as before. And so if people want to make them public for that one within our workspace um, that we are just working on, you can do so below that that teacher place. But again, you're not sharing your student information. You are sharing what you've created um, down below here, not visible publicly. So that would be searchable in that database. And again, we just ask you to remind you if you are sharing that information or anything that you've created in here, that we have to respect copyright when we do that. So for instance, if I'm an elementary teacher and I make this awesome workspace to share with my students and it has a lot of math up um, resources in here, that is something under copyright that this would not be something we would use to make uh, in big from that. So just a consideration uh, from that regard. So in terms of that, um, we're pretty much on time to flip over um, to some of our our question period. So we're going to hand it over to the awesome Catherine, who's going to kind of look over some of those uh, options that we were just shared and the questions coming in on that sheet. Perfect. I actually just got word in my earpiece that we have about four questions to get to. So, uh, uh huh. Okay, we're going to get to them. So this first one is going out to Heather. So Heather, this is coming from a grade seven, eight teacher, and they want to know what happens if you put a due date in the evidence column? So does it lock the student out after the due date? Do you use due dates uh, in grade seven, eight? Because she was also making the understanding we're in elementary, we're a little bit more flexible with deadlines, but how would you use deadlines in that evidence column? And what does it do? Uh, so that's a great question. I, I think that, that the due dates, I mean, right now we have, the understanding that due dates are a little bit more flexible than normal. Um, I always put due dates on my cards uh, under normal circumstances and now as well, uh, but it does not cut students off. Once that due date has passed, they can still access the content of the, that card. They can still complete it and demonstrate their learning after the fact. Um, but it's really, it's a good reminder, a good prompt for them when they log into that student dashboard to see, I have these assignments coming up, this is what I need to tackle, and this is what I should probably be doing first, because this is my oldest due date. Okay, perfect. That's a great answer. Um, Julian, this question is coming to you. How do we get to the dashboard for teachers again? The teacher just forgot how to do it, uh, I believe. So can you just demonstrate how a teacher would get to their dashboard? Copy that, Catherine. Thank you very much. I'm just signing on. Um, I will be presenting my screen. 40 degrees today, ladies and gents. It is a little bit hot in Misty Day's kitchen, but I will show you how to do that. So um, what Catherine is saying is uh, you are able to access Staff Portal, which is, again, one-stop shop for teachers and for students. So um, personally, what I like to do when I'm logging in, um, I have my Staff Portal tab here at the top as a favorite. And get into the habit of that and you have the option of bumping right into your dashboard or right into your workspace so for today i'm going to bump right into my dashboard and uh, you are going to see some of the color coding um what i like to call the color coding amazingness but maybe that's just me because i love curriculum colors and again purple is french science is science is blue social studies is green so the first thing that you're going to want to remember though is that when hapra at the back end in august when all of our subjects are pushed out to us based on power school and what we're assigned to none of these subjects make any sense so here smi 1 fre 791920 it's jargon to me um and i always have to pop in and see which students are in and say oh, oh okay yeah that student's in grade four therefore this is my grade four class so this is your section that you're actually assigned to in power teacher so to edit that you have this little pencil button and what i always love to do is click it at the end of august let's be honest, at the beginning of August when it's done. And I like to rename it to grade four French immersion. And again, I love purple. I always tell my students at the beginning of the year that if we are working in our Google Drive, not Opera Workspace, that I get them to color code this exact same subject purple in their folder on their Google Drive so that I don't have to say, okay guys, open your French folder. I say, okay, these we're going to open our purple folder so that primary it works on that end too here you can see again another code i know that this is my grade five six french immersion class so i could rename it grade five six french 
immersion and you do have all of those um, options to um, to color code them. And if, if you want to revert it, you can easily revert the changes back to the code if you were more comfortable with that. Um, what you can also do, sorry to take up time, is um, usually at the beginning of the year, especially for French teachers, you are assigned to a whack load of subjects. So if you're not teaching science um, in your immersion section, this star right here allows you to actually hide it. So it says, this class will no longer show in my classes. I'm going to refresh my page. Let's make sure that we don't see grade four science we refresh and it's not going to pop up anymore and you can easily get back to that when you go into all of your classes and then you can pick it out searching in grade four science maybe you lost it oh no classes found um that's uh not what was supposed to happen but uh, you're gonna have to go down and scroll down and find it but this is all of the previous classes that I've been assigned throughout my teaching career with APRA. So uh, you just want to go back and find it. And here it is right at the top. So I'll star that and then go back to my classes and it'll pop up again. Back to you, Catherine Wink. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you so much. Can you change the order, Julian? You don't have to show your screen again, but can you change the order of those classes? Um, you know what? I, like you mean in, in, in where? Let's see. I actually haven't ever tried, but if you I rename them, I think. It goes by oh, alphabetical yeah, you can. order. You can change the order of them. So okay. um, you can drag them, click and drag, and drag around just like you can the workspace cards. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Riveting, riveting piece of work there, <laughs> Julian. Um, our next question is for Tracy. So Tracy, we kind of touched on it yesterday a little bit. I asked Heather uh, the same question. So what would be the benefit for a teacher using workspace? We often talk about how it's great for our students because it's a one-stop shop. But as the teacher, why does this help teachers out in their role by doing everything in one space? Um, I just find it so much easier. Um, I find the folders, when I used to use the folders, they would just get so full. Um, and the students had a hard time navigating and finding stuff. I had a hard time finding it. I just find that it just flows so much easier. Um, yeah, I just, I just find yeah. it's just such an easier way to present information to the students and to exactly. collect information. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for the teacher, right? Uh, like you said, it's really hard to go and find things in your Google Drive all the time. Um, so in terms of teacher like approach to workspace, everything is located there for you to see your student work, right? And for you to give the feedback mm -hmm. and for you to assess everything. So again, mm -hmm. like it, not only go ahead. It's, it's so much easier to give feedback. I, uh, I'm giving so much feedback. I started always in workspace and, um, you know, I'll, I keep a bunch of like, I've made these little digital stickers and I keep them in my Google keep and I just slap a sticker just cause right now without seeing my students every day, I find, I really want them to know that I'm actually looking at all their work. So, um, in the classroom, you know, we could talk about it, but right now, you know, grade six students don't always check their email. I know it's very shocking, um, but I've been making these cute little stickers and I was just put a sticker on it and um, just so they know that I've actually looked at it and yeah. uh, I, I do what Heather does and I'll tag them in it. And the kids are getting really good at responding to my emails and they're noticing that I'm putting stickers on. And so I, I'm seeing more engagement too. Um, awesome. It's just it's just such better workflow. Awesome. Good. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, so Sarah had a quick question. If we rename the class on dashboard, do students see the updated name? No, they don't. Uh, that's only on your end. So if you're renaming something in uh, Happer dashboard, you see that rename, but the student can go into their own folder and rename it to something that may be more approachable for them. Um, this is a last question going out to Bill because I realized I'm not even plugged in, so all of these questions are just coming from my head. So this question is going out to Bill. So Bill, on the individual activity page, yeah. are you aware of a way to filter groups on that individual activity page? I know you can do it on cards in the workspace, but I haven't found a way to do it on the individual activity page. And this teacher teaches seven music classes each term. So she's clearly looking for a way to just better organize everything. Yeah, um, 
in terms of that, I think uh, uh, the reflection is uh, is accurate. I think that's why people kind of like using just the evidence card themselves because it gives them the most flexibility to go into a card that's either tied to a class or tied to a group. Um, the activity summary and individual individual activity, I think people use, but I think they use the the card the most. Um, so I would say right now there is no way to to filter groups within that individual activity. But I will say that Hapara and, and the OCSB have a good partnership. And at the bottom of all our Hapara workspaces and dashboard pages, at the bottom it says, how can we improve this page? So if you put that feature request in there that you'd love to see this, they really do start consolidating with it. And we meet with them regularly to try to do that. So if it's something that's really irking you or you think in the moment that, oh, it'd be really great if I could do this, I would encourage people to do that as well. But coming back to that point, no, right now in terms of filtering. And I've, I've, I've actually submitted um, a couple of those things and they get back to you right away. And I actually had a, like a webinar like this, but with people in New Zealand, it was so cool. And they were showing me, they took my comment and they were showing me what they were doing with it. And it was, it was really cool. It's such a responsive company. Like they're really all about making it better for us. Awesome. So those are all the questions we have. Perfect. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up this piece. And we know that people are, um, we've kind of come to our time, but we are, we're going to let people know that we are recording this for the pieces on the uh, headers. We're going to stay behind and kind of give you some, uh, some expertise uh, from our team, but I'm going to share my screen one more time. Um, and just leading into this, I do, I do absolutely want to thank uh, Tracy, Julian, and Heather for for joining us today to share your experience and expertise with the system. Um, we're always learning. This tool is so massive and the ways you've shown us how you use it. Um, just now the same early adopters are using it in completely different ways. And that's such an, an awesome permission piece that it's, yes, we can use it in our own ways that makes sense to us and our own students. So thank you for sharing um, that awesomeness as well. Um, in terms of for continued support, obviously you have us and we showed our kind of Twitter handle. So uh, uh, that, that piece as well. On our OCSB how-to channel, there is a playlist um, that you can have access to. And of course, we're going to upload this webinar there afterwards within the OCSB how-to. So this is just one of the playlists. And you can see that this is kind of broken down into a lot of these pieces that has been created by our awesome LT team. Um, so you'll see that there's also some webinars from Hapara that they changed through so much. And this is a student dashboard walkthrough. So some of the tickets we get in uh, to the OCSB and questions from teachers is how can we give them that dashboard walkthrough like we did today or Bill did. Um, so then the, the Hapara has done that. So you can always share them this link to the parents as to help support them. And we are working with our, with CSPA and the Parent Association to help uh, support parents at home as well. So you can see that this playlist has a lot of things broken down uh, through today, just in case um, you can always reference this one, but this is also there for you. Um, a help desk ticket for anything technical. So if you're missing a class or something just doesn't seem right with the setup, uh, please put in a help desk ticket. And then your LT consultant, next slide, I'll show you who they are. And of course, Hapara has their YouTube channel, which is where we pulled a lot of those videos from. And even something when it's really crazy and then it gets past the OCSB and our consultant LT team, they sometimes going right to the source, there's a submit a request piece and that's how you get that uh, feedback and contact back like Tracy was mentioning as well. There's just something so glitchy, I think it's just tied to me or something something beyond what I've ever heard. Um, and sometimes even in your own workflow, um, if it's so crazy, you might email Bill and then I'll put it, I'll, I'll put in a ticket. So you're kind of just waiting on me to, to do that or to answer a, a ticket. So sometimes that, that feature doesn't hurt as much as well. Um, and so last thing as well, we mentioned the family of schools consultants for our LT team. So you can see there's me at the bottom, my Twitter handle at Bcore2. Uh, right now I look over Sacred Heart and All Saints and you have the awesome Stephanie Pearson, Catherine Wake, and uh, Miss Audra Albermitis, and no schools that they uh, they look over. But again, those are just guidelines for us to make sure that we've broken apart our time. You will see us in all the schools <laughs> and and supporting each other when we need to to be in all of them. So you might have seen them in your school, even though if they're not associated with it. So again, please reach out to us as we go through there. Um, again, I mentioned the certification, and we are looking at getting information out for the over the next week for some certifications with it within house within. Uh, the OCSB maybe to try to compact it before the end of June or even over a two weeks uh, stint. So look for more information on that either uh, to confirm or to look at uh, us doing that within the OCSB outside of Haparas. So this would be an OCSB version of it. So um, keep your ears and eyes peeled for that. So we addressed our questions. 
And so now um, here are some resources that uh, Heather and Tracy are going to reference. Uh, but now this time, I'm going to thank everybody for joining officially uh, as we go through. And this time is going to be that bonus time about uh, staying on and seeing how you could use these templates to create headers for your cards and kind of make them like they made them, which is uh, always a popular request and question we get. And um, of course, for those people that uh, have prior commitments, uh, we will be recording this uh, as well. So I'm going to pass this on uh, to uh, Tracy and Heather and stop sharing my screen. And uh, you can share your screen. Uh, uh, who, uh, is Tracy, I think, is going first, but you can confirm. Maybe Heather can show us how to make the cards, and then I can just show how to put them in the workspace. Sure. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay, so I will present my screen and kind of walk you through the process uh, that I use to make these cards. So uh, within this slide deck that Bill has shared, you can find a link to this slide deck. And within it, I just kind of walked through uh, the steps to create it uh, and included all of the color codes for those Hapara, those existing Hapara cards. So you have those readily available. And a couple links just to the Bitmoji extension if you want to have it readily available up top here. Uh, and then also uh, a link to a website that has some really fantastic uh, free icons. So on the first slide, you will find uh, this link. So it's a link to a blank Google drawing template and the dimensions for these, uh, the, like the perfect header image size have already been set. So it will prompt you to make a copy and then you can work with that. So I'm going to open up sample of that and kind of walk you through how I do this. So I always start with a large rectangle in the background. This just gives you uh, your background color and makes it visible. I'll fill it with whatever color I'd like. Uh, sometimes I like to add a second shape and I like to put it down at the bottom and then I like it to match a specific Kapara color for a card. So if I want that mint color, I'm gonna grab that code. Use the custom option and switch it here. And then I'm going to add a huge text box because I want my text to be really visible and easy to read from a distance. And I'm going to make it big. Pick a font that I like. Text in. Uh, I can change this to whatever color I'd like. If I want it to kind of match and keep in with or keep with the theme, or if I want to leave it black, I can do so as well. And then I'm going to pull some images that I like to use. Maybe it is uh, just an open laptop. I'll resize that so it's nice and big. Place it where I'd like it. And then you can just kind of move things around, put them where you prefer them. There's no right or wrong way to do this. Uh, for my students, I like to give them a prompt. I like to tell them, you know, kind of what they're going to be looking at. So maybe I'm going to take uh, this image of the slide deck. So this kind of title page. I'll add take my snipping tool and take a quick picture of it. And then I will come back here and I will add and resize that image to kind of fit into this little. Laptop. The other thing that I like to do here is I um, I cite my so like the tr tribute to the author. I'll add the link to the image that I used, just so that if I want to use it later on, it's really easy to find. I'll just shrink that down and kind of just tuck it underneath my image. You can change the color of this afterwards. Um, I will say that flat icon is fantastic. You can find pretty much any image you could possibly want here. And then you can also search collections. So if you want like a really consistent set of images, you can do that here. Um, and then you can kind of reuse them over and over again. Uh, and then I just like to store all of my header images that I've created in these folders. And I can share them with my colleagues or I can share them with um, friends. I have linked these, uh, the ones I used in this session. So a link to a folder, and you can make a copy of these within here. You can use them as templates. There's some other ones from a previous LLJ session, but all the links to the images or the resources that were used have been added, so you can access those images as well. And I will turn it over to Tracy, and she can explain how to go about uh, downloading and uploading. 
All right. Um, as my screen is loading here. Okay, so in my workspace, it's really easy um, to add the headers, but you do have to do it first. So um, you just create your card and then grab your headers wherever you store them on your computer. Um, sorry. <laughs> and um, I do keep all of my headers like, um, um, Heather was saying sort of in little folders um, that they all kind of look the same. And then you actually, the weird thing is that you have to do is you actually have to exit out and then you can make your title and save your card. And then you can add any resources you want. So once you've exited out and it's really easy to do and um, they're super creative, they look really pretty, but you can, they also have a, a really great purpose. So um yeah, that's how you do it. Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, I know that um, when you went to upload yours as well, some people have used uh, file stream as well. So when they save that image, when they download it, they can save it to their Google Drive. And uh, so, so for some people that are, are using that workflow as well, which is great. And also, um, I, I like that you mentioned uh, citing it, Heather, about using those images and making sure that the author has it. Um, if you are in the uh, the drawing or a slide or, or whatever, and you go through the Explore button or the Insert image and you search within Google and not your drive, those are already sort of filtered um, through uh, Free Share as well. You may not get all the options. Like if you're searching for like the Ottawa Senators logo, it's not going to pop up because that's copyrighted to the NHL. Um, but there are ones that are available. So if it is in there, you can kind of click and drag it over as well. Well for those people that are are using that uh, that feature too, but I really like how um, even myself going back a couple of weeks, knowing that we were going to do this session, it's like oh I better get up to date on uh, on using these uh, headers myself because uh, before we confirm this awesome team, uh, I was I was ready to do it. And uh, who did I go to? I went to Tracy and Heather's uh, support to be able to get it, and through Hapara on their hub, which was great. And just uh, kind of reminded myself of how simple it was. It was. I just created something in Google, whether it's through the drawing or the slides, and I just made sure it was an image, and then I just uploaded it there. So basically, uh, it was that creativity that led itself to it, and then just saving in those files. So thank you for sharing your time. And and your uh, resources with uh, the OCSB as well, um, Tracy and Heather on that one as well. Um, I was a color guy, I am a color guy still too there, Julian, so I'm I, I'm learning both ones. But again, it just comes back to uh, uh, just how you want to use it and uh, how it makes sense to you and your students. So I love the headers. The headers yeah. are fabulous. I, yeah. I've learned something, so thank you guys. That is absolutely fantastic stuff. Yeah, so again, um, so thank you uh, for Catherine for moderating those questions for us and uh, and to uh, of course uh, Tracy, Julian and Heather again thank you for for sharing everything with us and staying on a bit late to uh, for some bonus time with uh, some headers. So for that we're going to say thank you and we're going to stop live streaming now and we will make sure we will upload upload this to the OCSB how to channel. So thanks everybody.